Well, I don't know if Imam Abu Bakr means I'm the mosquito or the bee. <laughs> I certainly hope you'll explain that to me uh, when we have our side conversation. Uh, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Was salatu was salamu ala Rasulillah. Sayyidina wa Nabiyina Muhammadin ibn Abdullah. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa mawala. Uh, Your Excellency the President, Your Excellency the wife of the President, Your Eminence, Your Excellencies, Your Highnesses, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, I've been asked to speak on these two important topics, which are, to my mind, interrelated. And the topics about which I've spoken and debated over the last two or three decades, as is known. Uh, let me begin by thanking His Eminence and the First Lady for giving us this opportunity to share some thoughts on the role of governments in dealing with these problems. Because we do know what the problems are, especially among the Ummah. We do know, those of us who deal with communities every day, what we deal with, with parents forcing young daughters into loveless marriages, with arbitrary divorce, with a lack of care within marriage and after marriage. Every day wives are complaining about husbands who claim their rights but do not take any of the responsibilities of marriage. Women being divorced with their children and husbands not taking care of those children, and those children ending up on the streets, drugs, political thuggery, violent extremism. We speak of the Al-Majiri problem, as if the Al-Majiri is the problem, when in fact the problem is irresponsible fathers who leave their children on the street. And it's important um, that we understand what is the role and the responsibility of those who have political authority, especially at the state level, on this issue. And perhaps there is no greater pointer to this when we deal with the Muslim part of this country than a simple fact that maybe many of us are missing. Starting 1999 and 2000, at least 12 states of the North declared that they have adopted the Sharia. The interesting thing is, in all those 12 states, apart from the Muslim criminal law, no other law has been codified. It's almost as if if you're not a thief, if you don't commit assault, if you're not a criminal, then the Sharia does not apply to you. You will not go to any of those states and find a law written that talks about consent in marriage, the rights of wives and husbands. What does Islam say about, about domestic violence if you beat your wife? What is the right of a wife when she's divorced? What are the responsibilities of the husbands? If a child is found on the street, is the father responsible and can the state hold him accountable? These are all Sharia. And they're far, far more important than just talking about cutting off the hand of a thief. And this is why, um, I mean, for me, in the last three years in Kano, we set up uh, this committee that looked at this law. We put up together scholars, uh, NGOs, and alhamdulillah, tomorrow the Sultan and myself will be submitting this law to the governor of Kano State. And if he deems it fit, he will pass it to the State House of Assembly. And this is a law that talks about the personal status of Muslims from marriage to divorce, to child rights, to inheritance, to wills and testaments. And we need to begin from there. So the question is, why is it that we have these issues. 
If you're allowed to marry two, three, or four wives, can you just marry four wives? Are there no guidelines, no regulations? If you're allowed to divorce your wife, do you just divorce your wife and there are no consequences, there are no, there, there's nothing that follows up? If you're allowed to marry and have children, do you just marry and have children without any responsibility? But we know that people, it's really men, have taken all the privileges that they have been given without any of the responsibilities. So wh what has happened? Where have we failed? And um, I'm not going to go into the details of these ones. I see there are a number of papers that are going to be presented around these issues. But we'll begin by talking about just one verse in the Quran. And I like this analysis because it's analysis that was done by Sheikh Al Islam Ibn Taymiyyah in his book, As Siyasat al Shari'iyah. And this is the verse that I think brings to bear the responsibilities of the scholars and the traditional rulers and the responsibility of the governors and the political authorities. Ibn Taymiyyah and his disciple Ibn Qayyim looked at this verse in Surah Al-Hadid. لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُلَنَا بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ وَأَنزَلْنَا مَعَهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْمِيزَانَ لِيَقُومَ النَّاسُ بِالْكِسْطَ وَأَنزَلْنَا الْحَدِيدَ فِيهِ بَأْسٌ شَدِيدٌ وَمَنَافِعُ لِلنَّاسِ وَلِيَعْلَمَ اللَّهُ مَنْ يَنْصُرُهُ وَرُسُلَهُ بِالْغَيْبِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَوِيٌّ عَزِيز We sent our messengers with clear signs and the scripture and the balance that the people should uphold justice. And we sent also iron with its mighty strength and many uses for mankind so that Allah could mark out those who would help him and his messengers, though they cannot see him. Truly, Allah is powerful and mighty. Now, Ibn Taymiyyah says that for their, first of all, the reason Allah sent prophets, the reason Allah revealed books is that there should be justice in this world. Justice in our relationship with our maker, and justice in our relationship with fellow human beings. And justice means that everyone is given his due right. Justice in a marriage means that if a man takes the pri privilege of being the head of the family, he takes the responsibility of being the maintainer and provider of the family. Because Allah says, Ar-rijalu kawwamuna ala nisa'i bima faddalallahu ba'dahum ala ba'dim wa bima anfaqu min amwalihim. Allah gave you that traditional headship of the family because you protect and maintain and provide. You cannot take that privilege and abandon the responsibility. And that covers your wives, it covers your children. Now what Ibn Taymiyyah says about this verse is that if you look at it, there are two components to it. Allah speaks about sending the messenger and sending the scriptures and sending the balance. This is a level of knowledge. For, for you to have justice, you must know what justice is. And this is what the prophet says. So you read the Quran, read the Hadith. What do we read there about justice? Is it in fact true that if you go through the Hadith of the prophet, a father has a right to force his daughter without her consent into a loveless marriage? Is it in fact true that you have a right to batter your wife? Is it in fact true that you have a right to have children that you leave to go on the streets begging? Is it true that when you divorce your wife, you can just tell her, pack up your things, you and your children, leave my house, go back to your father's house, and that is the end? The answers are there in the scripture. They are there in the message of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And after the prophets have passed away, it is the responsibility of the traditional and religious leaders to continue saying that this is the message, this is what Islam says is justice. But the second part of the verse speaks about iron. وَأَنزَلْنَا الْحَدِيدَ فِيهِ بَأْسٌ شَدِيدٌ وَمَنَافِئُ لِلنَّاسِ 
and iron and the strength that it represents, Ibn Taymiyyah says, is political power. I can spend 100 years saying that it is wrong, it is un-Islamic for a man to beat his wife. It is the governor and the status of assembly who will pass a law. It is the courts and the police who will make sure that if a wife is beaten, she can go and get justice. The scholars cannot do that. The Amias cannot do that. We can speak from here to the end of this year and say that if you have children, you are responsible for their maintenance. If you have a house and your wife has five children and you divorce her, don't tell her to go to her father's house. You leave the house for her and go to your own father's house. Because you are supposed to provide, you are supposed to provide her with accommodation. Now I can say that, and the sheikhs can say that, but I do not have the power to do it. It is only the governments that will pass a law and say that any man who divorces his wife with children is obliged to provide them with accommodation and maintain his children, and there should be the law and the courts and the system that will enforce. So, the problem, the problem is these two groups of human beings are those who will stand and answer to Allah if there is no justice. Because the, the whole of revelation was for there to be justice on earth. And those whom God has empowered with that responsibility are these two groups. We, the traditional and religious leaders, have an obligation to command justice, to say this is what is just and this is what should be done. The politicians who have political power have an obligation to put in place the processes that will make sure that this justice is complied with. And if you look at the verse in the Quran, it says, وَأَنزَلْنَا الْحَدِيدَ فِيهِ بَأْسٌ شَدِيدٌ وَمَنَافِئُ لِلنَّاسِ Political power does not just have the oppressive power of the state. It's not just about the courts and the police and the prisons. It says, وَمَنَافِئُ لِلنَّاسِ As governors, you also have benefits social safety nets, economic empowerment, incentives. So when we speak about the role of governments, if we just stick to this verse, your role is to ensure that justice is established and you will be asked. Do not think you will not be asked. All these women who are crying, for every woman who is battered in your state, and you have not protected her, wallahi, Allah will answer you. For every child who is left uncatered for, begging on the street, and you have not held his father responsible, wallahi, Allah will answer you. Because Allah says, وَلِيَعْلَمَ اللَّهُ مَنْ يَنْسُرُهُ وَرُسُلَهُ بِالْغَيْبِ Allah is going to mark out those who help him and help his messengers without seeing him. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Kafa bil mar'i ithman an yudayya ama ya'ul. It is enough of a sin, enough of a sin for a man to abandon those who he is responsible for their maintenance. Where did we get it that it, you are allowed to have a child and abandon him to beg? Where? Where did we find that you are allowed to marry wife number one, wife number two, wife number three, wife number four, and leave them hungry? Who gave you that right? The verse, the verse that said you can marry four wives, if you want, and if you can do justice. At the end it says, Dalika adna Allah That phrase, 
was interpreted by Imam Shafi'i and by Zaid bin Aslam to mean that is closer that you do not have too large a family. The Prophet asked us to pray, to seek refuge with Allah against jahadul bala, severity of trials. The Caliph, uh, don't be a mosquito here. Um, <laughs> The Caliph, I'm going to round up. <laughs> the Caliph, the Caliph, Omar bin Khattab, and, and now listen to this, it's very important because when people talk about people not being able to maintain families just marrying, they think this is coming in 2019. The Khalifa, Omar bin Khattab, said, Jahadul Bala'i, Kathratul Iyali, wa Gillatul Shay. What is meant by severity of trial is to have a very large family and little money. The prophet asked us to pray against it. Yet somebody who is unable to feed one wife will decide that he wants to marry four and that God will provide for him. When the prophet said, seek praise. Meanwhile, you have big men like the sultan here who are afraid of taking more than one. So, so, so I, I have been reminded I have 15 minutes and I'm aware that His Excellency is here. Um, I, I will not go into all the issues. I've, I've seen enough papers going to discuss divorce, domestic violence, marital discord. But if there is one thing I think we can take from here, is that the responsibility for dealing with these issues is not that of the people. It rests on two groups of people. We, we who are emirs and scholars, have a responsibility to continue to speak up against this injustice. And our hope is that the people will listen. We're not hoping that people will go to jail. We're hoping that people will hear and know that it is wrong to beat your wife. It is wrong to divorce her arbitrarily. If divorce comes, you should maintain your children. If you have children, you should feed them and educate them. If you are too poor to feed your children, please go out and beg. Don't send them to go and beg. You go out. We're hoping that people will listen. But we're also hoping that if people choose to ignore if someone decides that he's going to batter his wife, that there will be consequences. We're hoping that we'll stop treating al Majire as criminals. When you see a young boy on the street, roaming the street, you say, where is your father? You go and arrest the father, not the boy. Because the father was the one responsible for him. In one of the hadith, and I'll, this is my final one, where the prophet talks about the need for sadaqah and says, begin with your family. He ends up with saying, the wife will say, tut imani au tut The servant will say, tut imani was ta'malani, was ta'malani. And the son will say, tut imani liman, uh, liman tatrukani. The wife will say, you either feed me or you divorce me. In other words, if you are married to her, you must feed her and maintain her. The servant will say, you feed me, then you make me work. You can't have a servant and make him work when you have not given him food. You can't make him work when he is sick and you have not given him health. And the son or the daughter will say, you feed me, to whom do you abandon me? You are not allowed to abandon your child to the street. You are supposed to maintain him. If you cannot maintain a wife, don't marry her. If you cannot maintain a child, do not give birth to him. If you cannot maintain a servant, do not employ him. And if you choose to, it is for our governors to make sure there are consequences. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfirullahaladzim.